thank staff, board members, volunteers, guests, and students at the first biannual Exploring Humanitarian Law panel. Tonight's panel ser serves as a culmination of all of the students and the instructors' hard work this summer. It is a testament to the passion and commitment of each and every one of our team members, and we are very excited to share with you all that we've learned throughout the summer. Human dignity is the main theme throughout the Exploring Humanitarian Law course, and it is defined as the true human worth of a person, a universal definition applicable to all peoples and without regard to race, color, sex, language, nationality, religious beliefs, political or other opinions, property, birth, ethnic or social origins, or any other considerations. Can any of you speak to how the basic concept of human dignity is preserved through the work you do? Speaking on behalf of the Red Cross, um, which is an organization that is 95% volunteer driven, uh, that's our workforce, um, we're, we're known for doing many things, including disaster response, international operations, services to the armed forces, uh, but it's all grounded in some fundamental principles about human dignity and neutrality. Um, that uh, we try to bring to our work each and every day. Uh, and to quickly respond to your question from a Red Cross point of view, one thing I've been so impressed at at the Red Cross in my couple of months here is going out on responses uh, to multifamily building fires is that our volunteers go out uh, working eight hour shifts after a long day that they've had at their own jobs. Um, and we'll respond to uh, a building fire uh, and you'll open the door um, and you honestly don't know what you're going to find. Uh, you, on my first response, uh, there, I just recall there was a Muslim family of about eight people packed into a two-bedroom apartment. They had just lost everything. Uh, it reeked of smoke, uh, an acrid smell. Uh, the building was all flooded with water. Uh, of those eight different people, they had about eight different emotions and experiences that they wanted to communicate from anger to grief to gratitude. Um, and then our volunteers would go to the, the apartment next door and the apartment next door to that and upstairs and downstairs and opening every door. You just wouldn't know who you would find, what situation they would be in, uh, what their life circumstances were, uh, what language they spoke. Uh, and so for the Red Crosser responding in these circumstances, uh, it was critical to be armed with an appreciation for the diversity within this city and within different communities uh, and a respect for people from all walks of life because you were going to be tasked with shepherding them um, through this journey of grief and loss to starting to rebuild their lives. We've gone and done damage assessments of buildings and we show up and all of a sudden I have an Islamic family where the only person left home is mom and then all of a sudden the son kind of shoves her aside and wants to talk to me directly but doesn't want to talk to me. He wants me to find somebody who's a male and be that team to talk to him. I'll get out of the way and let him do it. If I'm running a dad team, I'll just you know, have one of the other guys get in there and take care of it if that's what they need. So we will never enforce any beliefs of ours on anybody, but it's our job to respect who we're dealing with. And that changes at the drop of a pin everywhere we go. And in New York, it changes five times a night, probably, <laughs> at least. So. At Love 146, just like the Red Cross, um, I think we're very grounded in human dignity. And <clears throat> one thing, that I have to think about, especially with our round home that's in the Philippines, uh, that's an aftercare facility that um, helps young women who have been um, saved from brothel raids. Um, one thing we have to remember is the, the amount of services that these young girls need um, and the, what we have to provide for them, um, numerous amounts of, between medical care and um, therapy and schooling. Um, many of these girls can be as young as eight years old. Um, and really realizing that their dignity has been stripped from them and we have to find a way to restore that. And specifically, love for us means to protect, defend, restore, and empower. And we use those principles um, throughout all of our programming, whether it be in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, or here in the United States. So dignity, human dignity is very important. And I think I'll, I'll answer the question not uh, with my primary current hat as executive director of Man of the Campaign, but more about the, uh, more from the, wearing the hat that I wore for most of my adult life, which is the 
journalist. And I think um, not working as a journalist, um, I think Chris Angelos embodied that that, that, I, that idea, that vision. But that you know, protecting and, and respecting human dignity by telling people stories. You know, I think we often, rightfully so, the media, journalism, journalists can get a bad rap for, for different transgressions. But for myself, having the opportunity to, to cover conflict and disasters and crises um, at Life Magazine and the Washington Post and places like that, I, I just feel I have a strong sense of responsibility, um, you know, and sort of a weight because you go into a situation, the Red Cross does this every single day here in New York and globally, but you go into situations when people are the most vulnerable, asking them to trust you, you know, and trust you, and you, you trust you almost with very little time to really build that trust, you know. Um, and it's a huge responsibility to ask people to let you into their lives, to take photographs, uh, to capture their stories, or, or to capture their lives in that moment, to take those stories and then and then do who knows what with them. And so I just feel like you know every 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 tragedy deserves to be recognized, deserves to be honored. I think you know as a reporter, as a photographer, videographer, whatever. Um, you know when people are working at their best in those in those positions. Um, Dignity is always um, upheld. Um, I'm typically working in, in countries, communities, languages that are not my own. And the same generally applies to many of the others with whom I'm working. So dignity can sometimes be a fine line given the fact that many of us are very far removed from, from where we physically are at the time. Um, over the last, well, in recent years, let's, let's just say that um, the way in which emergency responses, disaster responses are managed, much more effort is made to explicitly acknowledge that question of dignity, even if we're looking at hundreds of thousands of displaced or hundreds of thousands of refugees from conflict, for example. Um, the way in which we engage with those individuals, with those, those families, the way in which assistance is or is not provided, or the types of assistance that are offered. Um, and perhaps most importantly, the way in which that assessment is conducted in terms of involving people in the analysis, it, moving away from this idea of the external experts and, and becoming the sympathetic, empathetic listeners uh, to the greatest extent possible, and trying to respond in ways that meets an immediate need. Maybe it's shelter and food and clothing tonight. But maybe, depending of course on time and place and everything else, maybe there are ways to respond to today's needs in ways that plant the seeds for tomorrow's recovery and return to normal lives or different lives in the, in the recovery longer term. In addition to the International Humanitarian Law, which is enacted during times of armed conflict, EHL draws specifically on the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The UNUDHR states that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of a person. Everyone has the right to own property. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. And everyone has the right to, to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including housing. Josh, with your extensive experience with Habitat for Humanity, can you speak about the ways in which Habitat would be considered as upholding the UN's Declaration of Human Rights? But there has been a lot of uh, discussion uh, in international law about whether shelter is a, a fundamental human right or not. Um, and uh, I think I would come from the perspective, both as a Red Crosser and having worked uh, in international housing and, and lo housing locally, uh, that, that obviously housing is necessary to sustain life, having shelter. Um, but it is really the foundation upon which all other, um, all other growth of a family or a household or an individual can occur. Um, it's really that basis uh, that allows someone the pursuit of happiness and, and to prosper. Um, 
And certainly what we see every day here at the Red Cross and in the 70,000 uh, emergencies we respond to every year across the country um, is, is the um, devastating effects of that uh, loss of housing. Uh, and what we see most often is when it it's occurs uh, to families who have, and individuals who have so little to begin with, um, and uh, are sort of in the street, uh, bewildered, uh, and bereft, and, and wondering what's next. Um, and so putting yourself in those folks' shoes, uh, and trying to understand you know, where they would go, what they would do, um, I think that promise and that pledge of housing is a rebuilding point for, for those households is absolutely fundamental and is, is just a, a, a building block of human dignity. Based on your experience within the American Red Cross, can you provide an example of the ways in which the Red Cross upholds the UN's, the UN's Declaration of Human Rights? Oh, sure. I, I can find many examples. Just in the past couple of weeks, or <laughs> those of us who have been active here at the Red Cross, we've had a busy uh, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, this will speak to it exactly, but in setting up shelters, uh, last week we set up a shelter um, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in the neighborhood of Bushwick, where there was a seven alarm fire and uh, hundreds of people had to be vacated in the street on a really hot day, and it was the day when those storms were coming in. So there was, a, there was definitely a lot going on. Uh, but our volunteers and staff, I really noticed, uh, made a tremendous effort to make this school where people had been, uh, were being sheltered, we were putting on cots, uh, to really attend to the individual needs and sensitivities of folks who were being placed in this environment, uh, folks who had disabilities, um, folks who had emotional distress, uh, and, and really catering to those individual needs and providing that, that fundamental level of dignity, uh, whether it was they were concerned about a cat that was missing or uh, a cell phone that was missing, I know that doesn't sound too dramatic, uh, but uh, really in those moments of crisis, the things that they were most concerned about um, and, and trying to provide uh, some human kindness uh, that put them at ease uh, was really extraordinary. Ian Shell defines a bystander as a person who is present without being involved at an incident where the life or dignity of others is in danger. A bystander may decide to intervene, directly or indirectly, in the incident. Intervening would turn a bystander into an upstander. Can you all speak about a time when you were a bystander and chose to be an upstander? Was there any consequences and the risk of taking the action that you did? What were the consequences and the risk of not taking action? The president of Love 146, I actually consider an amazing, amazing individual. And uh, he's also my quote guru. <laughs> he remembers every single quote on the sun. And he, um, he oftentimes in his talks quotes, um, yeah, I couldn't get his name right earlier, so I'm going to butcher it, Yehuda Bauer, who is a Jewish historian. And um, I found this to be an appropriate quote to share this evening. So Yehuda says, I think we should add three new commandments to the existing ten. Thou shall not be a victim, thou shall not be a per perpetrator, and thou shall not be a bystander. And uh, one thing that I do find and that we talk about with the students in all of our classes, um, we have two programs that I run here in the United States, specifically in Connecticut, and one is called Tell Your Friends. And we educate kids on trafficking and giving them tools and knowledge to protect themselves. And we also talk about being a bystander, and, you know, seeing things on the streets, especially in their communities, and um, how important it is to be the upstander. Um, and specifically, um, speaking with my own personal experience, um, two things that I'll, that I'll say. Uh, I was bullied quite a bit when I was younger. Um, and so bullying, I have absolutely no tolerance for. So whenever there is any bullying going on, I, the, the wrath of the devil comes out of me. <laughs> it's so innocent, I know I can't. Um, no, but that's something that I really um, am passionate about besides uh, the sex trafficking of children. Uh, but secondly, one example, um, last December, I was doing a training with law enforcement and uh, teachers, school personnel on the issue of trafficking, um, kind of what to look for, really human trafficking 101 kind of stuff. And I've always found it very difficult 
to speak with law enforcement about this issue because they do see a different side of um, the victims or survivors that we come in contact with. Um, and plus, I'm a social worker, and they're like, who are you a social worker? I don't want to talk to you. Um, no, but really, they um, it's difficult to, to really communicate with them. And so I made sure during our breaks to reach out to the law enforcement to really talk to them one-on-one -on -one to find ways to um, talk to them and help them understand. And I had one officer, uh, a detective actually, who was working on a case with a young girl that I was working with, say, you know, I, I get what, you, what you're saying. You want us to uh, look at these girls as victims instead of criminals. But in my work, and excuse my French at the moment, um, a whore is a whore. Mm -hmm. And I think my mouth dropped to the floor when I heard him say that, um, but I had to keep my composure and the devil not to come out. Um, but when I think about what were the consequences or risk of not taking action and the whole theme of dignity is that I am also a voice for the voiceless. Um, many of these individuals don't have a voice until we bring them to a point of having a voice um, and knowing that they can have a voice. And so it was my duty, I felt, in that moment to really um, defend the voiceless and defend the young girl that he was talking about um, and find any way possible to help him understand that, no, she's not a whore, she's a human being. Um, who was forced to do things against her will. Um, and that goes for even adult women. Um, not every adult woman, but that's something that's a whole other. I should just be quiet right now. <laughs> but you get my point. I think we, we all make choices. We're all bystanders. We occasionally, for whatever reason, we're compelled or inspired to stand up and actually recognize that person that, who, who's in need, in need of help. Um, one example, which I want to share with you all, uh, to be very brief, happened not too far from here um, on 34th Street about a year and a half ago. I was coming out of a movie theater, and this is probably an example that everyone in this room relates to on some level, but I was coming out of a movie theater with my daughter, who was nine, nine years old at the time. we just seen a movie which I actually loved called Despicable Me, <laughs> and uh, we were walking to the train, going down to the station on the C train, as we're descending the stairs to go to the subway station, um, it was the, the subway, that subway entrance there, where there was no booth. Uh, we heard a commotion, we heard shouting, and we heard thumps. Um, as we were descending the, descending the stairs, people were passing us coming up the stairs. Business people, couples, um, students, um, you know, young men, young women, individuals. As we, get to the bottom, as we got to the bottom of the stairs into the subway entrance near the platform, I saw what the commotion was about. Um, an adult man was physically assaulting his, who I presume was his girlfriend on the stairs. He was beating her with his fist, closed fist, slapping her, calling her an array of names, and I'm sure we've all heard at various points on the subway or on the city streets. Um, and people were walking by, you know, people were, they, they looked and turned away, they walked by, they didn't stop. Um, you know, no one asked them if she needed help, and she obviously didn't because she was being beaten in public. And um, I, I can't tell you just emotionally <laughs> the, 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 the spectrum of feelings that ran through me that so many people passed by this situation and did nothing and said nothing. Um, it just, it just, for me, this said everything about the issues that we're facing today. And so, you know, I see, we come down the stairs, we see this happen. This guy's beating up his girlfriend, no one's doing anything, no one's even calling the police. And my daughter starts pulling me toward the turnstile and said, Daddy, let's get on the let's go, like, don't do anything. You know, I, my, the nonprofit that I oversee, you know, we focus on violence between the girls. So obviously, she knew that this would be a scene that would actually get to me of all people. So she's pulling me toward the turnstile, and I have to, I have to admit to you all, um, for a few moments I did, you know, I found my feet walking towards the turnstiles to get on the subway, like everyone else, and swipe my card and not look back. But I just felt like, um, first of all, as a man, as a father, 
I could not actually look her in the eye again, you know, knowing that in her memory she would have this memory of someone being beaten up, and I didn't do anything about it. That was the first thing. The second thing was that, you know, and all of us, you know, have our respective causes or issues that we focus on and care about, you know, as do you all in the audience. But I just felt like, you know, this that was a situation where, you know, being a bystander would have been the safe thing, and a lot of people who passed the situation by probably thought that, male and female, but it would have been morally destructive for me to carry that around. And the, the risk would have been moral, you know, I was thinking about the physical risk of actually doing something about it and jumping in and trying to stop it, but th that would have been outweighed by whatever I felt inside from that moment onwards. So what we did was, I, I, told, her, I told my daughter, I said, I cannot get on the train with this happening. So we turned around, holding her hand, this nine-year-old girl and me, and I dragged her over to where this guy's beating his girlfriend, and I stand right in front of him. I didn't touch him, I didn't put my fist up and I reached my hand out, but I stood right in front of him. And I, I nodded and I said, are you okay? Do you need any help? I didn't say that to her, but I said to him. And he ignored me. He stopped hitting her, and he, he kept cursing, he ignored me. And after a few moments, he walked away and left her there. and left. Exit, he went up the stairs and exited, and then she collected herself and she went away. Uh, collected herself and went in a different direction. And, you know, my daughter on the train came at that point, perfect timing. We got on the train, we stood on the train for a moment, and just kind of let it marinate, let it re reflect on what just happened. And, and my daughter said something to me when she sort of validated <laughs> everything I'd done in my life to that point. She said, This is, this is why you stand up for a woman. I said, this is why. You know, because too many people look the other way, too many of us are bystanders on this issue, on refugees, on trafficking, so many issues. We look the other way and don't do anything. And, you know, and that's why these things happen every single day. EHL defines armed conflict as a situation in which two or more organized groups are engaged in armed fighting, whether international or domestic. Jimmy and Nicole, in your experiences, have you seen armed conflict affect the following vulnerable populations, such as civilians and non-combatants, prisoners of war, child soldiers, refugees, women, and girls? Yes, it is yes, for me. Um, I, you know, I was a journalist for a long time and focused on conflict and post-conflict situations, um, especially focusing on child soldiers. So um, I have seen armed conflict affect these groups. and. Yeah, it's interesting with the, the groups that you named, uh, because you know, refugees, the Jewish child soldiers, um, the transcendent population of all these is women and girls. Um, you know, I'm sure Nicole will echo that sentiment, but you know, there, there's a saying in journalism that truth is the first casualty of war, but I, 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 would, I would revise that and say that um, women and youth are the first ones who are often victims, uh, they're for displacement, for violence, um, for denial of food. Women and girls especially suffer in conflict and crisis because of the, the, the difficulty of getting access to reproductive health care, reproductive you know, obstetric health care, um, and often you know, suffer and die needlessly from that. And I think that we're in a situation now in 2012, um, when I first started covering conflict in Rwanda, the genocide, Fast forward 18 years, we're in a situation now where um, armed groups, especially non governmental armed groups, consciously target women and girls, consciously target civilians, consciously target non combatants and refugees because they're the most vulnerable. And, and those groups who do take these actions understand that by inflicting the greatest suffering and pain and loss on these populations, you know, it sends a message to to their enemies, to the, to the groups that are the government, or the groups that are fighting that no one is safe. Um, you know, we can have, you know we can reach you where you're most vulnerable, and um, we're willing to do anything to win. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, I really don't have much to add um, besides, you know, what makes women and girls susceptible in these situations is vulnerability, and you really touched on. On vulnerability and conflict, create, conflict creates opportunities for uh, traffickers to prey on the vulnerable. 
Um, and when you have children who are left behind, um, who have no family, no one to protect them, their basic needs aren't met, um, threats, intimidation, violence, um, it makes them vulnerable and it makes it that much easier for a trafficker to, to prey on them. Throughout the summer, we spoke a lot about the humanitarian dilemma, the concept that humanitarian actions require making a choice that has both advantages and disadvantages, including the option of doing nothing. Rebecca, in your role as an American Red Cross Public Affairs volunteer, can you speak about a time that reflects this concept? It's gotten to the point where it's newsworthy to local or national or any level of media then the role clicks immediately into a new role. You know, whether I'm trying to do damage assessment or I'm trying to handle a situation, once media is involved, my role is protecting the privacy and the dignity of whoever's been directly affected by an incident. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter whether it was a fire, it doesn't matter whether it was a hurricane, it doesn't matter if you know, it's a crane collapse. It really doesn't. No matter where I go, if media are there and they are trying to get into the inside story of somebody who really doesn't want to tell them. Then it's my job to protect that person. You know, I mean, the number of situations where you figure, you know, I, mean, I don't know, for most of the journalists I know, I think their ultimate and the most aggravating job they ever have to do is going, so how do you feel now? When you ask a victim of anything that, they usually don't want to tell you. They usually give you that look like, if you even need to ask me, you're a moron, so why the heck are you in my face? But most of the time, I, I can't really think of a situation that I didn't get in directly in when that happened. When it was thrown in front of me, whether it's been you know large fires that had multiple fatalities, or hurricanes where I'm suddenly dealing with people who've gone crazy, or you know, frankly, even better events like when planes crash and everybody's alive. You know, there's some, when people do not want to be involved, it's my job to protect their human right to privacy, no matter what. And that's, it, you'll never, in a situation like that, you never don't engage. If media get in somebody's face, it's kind of like what you were saying, if somebody picks on somebody weaker than you are, you're always going to get in there. You know, it's the one thing, it's like they get in mine and say, how do I feel, I'll tell them. But if they're going after somebody who, barely speaks English as a first language, you already is scared to death of them, then somebody's got to get in between. And that's why they have me doing this as a volunteer. From your knowledge of international humanitarian law, what are the rights that refugees have and how are they observed? And also, can you cite different examples of the treatment of refugees internationally? In the briefest of overviews, there are a range of rights applicable to refugees internationally. Uh, the most important one, perhaps, or the most overarching, is that refugees cannot be forcibly returned. And this applies even to countries that have not signed on to the other conventions. It's customary international law. So even if you see yourself, your state, as outside of these frameworks, in the greater scheme of things, you're still bound by this principle that refugees cannot be forcibly returned. Within that, then, there are a range of other more, what would you say, um, more expected rights that are protected under humanitarian law, which, again, I'm assuming you all know far better than I do, but not to be expelled, not to be punished for entering the country illegally, uh, the right to work, housing, education, relief, freedom of religion, access to the courts, legal system freedom of movement within the territory, ID card, travel documents. The converse of that is that refugees also have expectations placed on them. It's not all a one-way street. And that they are also expected, in receiving those protections, they too are expected to abide by the rule of law in their current country of asylum and to respect public order. Um, in terms of the treatment of refugees in different contexts, um, here too, I think it's, it's very easy to look at some of these boards online. The diversity of refugee experiences is so great that I'm, I'm reluctant to, to pluck out one or two examples for feel that, the, that they would represent the refugee experience as a whole. 
when you consider the diversity of conflicts, disasters, social, political, ethnic people that we're talking about, there is no, there's no quick and dirty answer. Um, so for example, we say Burmese refugees. Well, who's, I mean, Burma is filled with dozens of ethnic groups. Some ethnic groups went west to Bangladesh. Some went east to Thailand. So talking about the, the experience of Burmese refugees, it's a very diverse, very long story. Uh, as it is with Somalis, for example, very different experiences for Somali refugees in Kenya or in Ethiopia, for Afghan refugees in, in Pakistan compared with Iran. Um, I think it's more interesting to, to look at our own perception, our own experience of migrants in our own country. In that, in many ways, I think the, the treatment of refugees is, is a reflection of, of how we treat migrants here. Uh, many of the same issues apply. For example, how do we feel in the US about migrants receiving health services? Legal migrants, illegal migrants. Now that same question applies in our in a range of other countries. In some places, yes, these people have the right to health services. Well, there's also a, a very large host community in many places that resents this other group's right to health services. Okay, uh, refugees have the right to work. Well, how do we feel about migrants working here in the US? And so a lot of these same issues are, are parallel. <coughs> Never the same, of course. Um, segregation, resentment, the, the role that migrants play in local economies. Uh, very, very diverse, very, very complicated, very sensitive issues. Um, also in terms of how these rights and laws are, are observed and implemented, as I said in the beginning, there's, there's an increasing shift toward more participation, more empowerment, more thinking longer term in what will this recovery look like after six months, after a year, after 10 years. Um, there's also a greater attempt to diversify the response to refugees. So there's no longer as much emphasis on the one size fits all solution. Now, welcome, here's your the classic refugee response was, okay, you now receive your shelter kit, your, your hygiene kit, your cooking kit, your food ration, one size fits all. So all of us here in the room, all of us would receive the same thing, but none of us need the same thing. We all have different priorities and different needs. We walk further down the street to the local bazaar and we find all of those cooking kits and hygiene kits and all the rest, that many of which were imported from overseas, with donated money. So even the efficiency of our response is undermined. So there's a greater emphasis now on trying to engage or to, to give more choice in refugee responses, such as responding with different amounts of cash in the same way that the New York Red Cross does after an apartment fire, prepaid debit cards. In many cases, what people need immediately is the ability to identify their own needs and, and to solve that problem themselves. We're certainly not the right ones to do it, but if we can facilitate that process, well then maybe there is some value in us being there. Um, and finally, as, a, as another attempt to further protect refugee rights, to improve response and, and the treatment of refugees, um, there's been an, initi an initiative called the Sphere Minimum Standards, trying to improve the quality of assistance that's given. So it's not simply everybody gets a tent or everybody has a shelter, but depending on the number of family members you have, we know that each family member needs to have three square meters per person. So a family of five has a different need from a family of three and a family of nine. Uh, each individual needs a minimum of 15 liters of water per person per day, etc. Now, it doesn't always happen. 
But the, the benchmark is there. The ideal is there. So that ideally we're responding more, more effectively. Um, but again, to go back to the beginning, the, the refugee experience, I, I can't even begin to claim to, to speak for that. But it's, it's very much a case of, of politics, of, of uh, context, of culture, of funding. Um, Habitat for Humanity not only builds homes locally and nationally, but internationally as well. In fact, the Global Village Volunteer Program allows teams of volunteers to travel around the world and advocate for better living conditions and raise funds for those in need. Josh, can you speak a little more about this program? How does building in communities that are recovering from either a natural or a human-caused disaster, disaster differ from our local needs here in New York City? When you are coming from the United States to go travel internationally to do um, any kind of mission work, um, you often uh, go in with a set of expectations, and uh, they are often not met, uh, sometimes for good and sometimes for bad. Uh, I think my experience, uh, uh, to pick out one, is uh, I, I did go uh, on a, an experience to build uh, uh, affordable homes, it was more like huts in a, um, a city, outside, a slum outside of Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, uh, which is in central Brazil, and it was uh, a community called Divine Spirit. And uh, uh, to, sp to speak to that experience, when the volunteers were Canadians and Americans, uh, about 15 of us going down to build for a week, uh, and do a lot of backbreaking labor. Uh, when we were uh, when we were first introduced to that community, uh, the residents uh, of this this village of this slum uh, laughed at us, and they thought it was absolutely hysterical uh, that we were coming in um, in our you know all of these affluent Westerners coming into this slum to do volunteer work. They'd never seen Western volunteers come in before. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously that wasn't the reception that we might have hoped for, having just come off about six airplanes and two bus rides. Uh, and, uh, but uh, as we, uh, you know, made connections over the week and were building uh, and engaging the community in what we were doing, there were just some really fascinating dynamics that developed. Uh, friendships were forged, and uh, I remember at first it was the children who wanted to volunteer alongside us to help uh, build these affordable homes. Uh, and by the end of the week, there was a whole community of people who were sort of arguing with each other to help these crazy Westerners uh, build these affordable homes in this community. Um, and, and to me, that, that experience just always spoke to the fact of um, um, the power of volunteerism and of service, um, and uh, that uh, even though you often don't don't get out of it what you might think, or you don't have the experience that what you think, that it's it's a really um, a powerful thing to put yourself, to get out of your skin, and to go into a whole different environment and try and shed all of the cultural baggage you're bringing um, in service of humanity. Um, and that um, people respond to that. Uh, and, and for me, that experience, and many others, including here at the Red Cross, have really been life-changing experiences. Uh, and it sort of uh, taught me that uh, you're never as smart as you think you are. Child soldiers are defined as anyone under the age of 15. Jimmy, can you speak to the impact of child soldiering not only on the children, but the families and communities from which they come? The phenomenon of child soldiering, or using child soldiers, is a um, it's completely, completely an amoral one because you know, based on what is happening to the kids, what they're being asked to do, what they're seeing, what they're being exposed to. But before focusing on child soldiers and more affected kids as a journalist, I spent a lot of time writing about gangs here in the United States. And it was the best preparation, but it also really illuminated um, what happens to kids when they're drawn to conflict because um, you know, they're either taken by force from their families, um, sometimes they're coerced or compelled in other ways. Um, it maybe there's an appeal to, to their sense of nationalism or family honor or ethnic pride, whatever. In some situations, they're paid. But um, once they're, you know, however they got to that situation where they're eight, nine, ten years old carrying a KB7, once they're in the situation, the experiences are, are pretty much the same whether you're in Sri Lanka or Colombia or Afghanistan. 
um, the kids are, are, are psychologically broken down because, you know, yet, I mean, from the eight world point of view, and when I was focusing on this issue, I kind of understood why you might want to use child soldiers if you're fighting a guerrilla war or if you're fighting a for a non-governmental force because, and, you know, for those of us who are parents or who are ever kids, and all of us who are at one point, um, we know, you know that the younger you are, the fewer inhibitions you have. So, you know, an eight year or nine year old may do something more willingly than a 17 year old would or an 18 year old would because, you know, a 17 or 18 year old is thinking about the moral consequences of their actions. They're thinking about the physical consequences of their actions, what could, what could happen to them, what could happen to their community, their families. And, 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 the, and the people who use child soldiers, um, they, they understand this. They understand that the younger you are, I can get a kid to throw a grenade into a classroom or I can get someone to, to blow up a bus full of people and they won't think twice about it. Um, I'm not sure who in here is familiar with or saw the films uh, Blood Diamond and Lord of War. If you saw Blood Diamond, the, the, that's probably really a really good indicator for, from my perspective when I saw the field. That's a good representation of what can happen to kids who are, who are drawn to child soldiering because um, you're physically abused, you're often denied food, um, sometimes you're given drugs to stay high. Um, as part of that psychological breakdown process, and this is very typical, they'll force you to kill someone that you know. So it could be your friend, it could be your sister, your brother, because they want, they want you to understand there's nothing um, you can't do. I mean, I spoke to, I spoke to kids who had been child soldiers, and they said, I, I never would have thought, you know, I could beat someone to death with a, with a, with a rock. I never would have done that. My parents didn't raise me that way. But that's what I did when I was a child soldier. So it's a situation where you're broken, you're stripped down, much like a gang, you're stripped down, um, and then you know your unit or your commander or the gang, whatever, becomes your family. Um, the commander is like a father figure, um, an authority figure to be sure, but a father figure. And and that unit, for as long as you that it exists, is is that's your that's your life. Um, and, and it's really a situation where whether you were a child soldier for a year or five years, it, it breaks down and it destroys your childhood. You, you can't go back to being a child um, at 13 if from the ages of eight to, not, eight to 12, you were killing people. I mean, there's no way you can go back to being a child. Even with the best care, the best rehabilitation, your child is gone. Um, having said that, it's crucial that kids um, who are fortunate or blessed enough to survive that experience um, have as much holistic care as possible. Education, psychosocial support, um, and our reintegration process. I mean, you asked about the impact of the families and the communities. Um, many families, many, many communities, the parents especially, I mean, I, I would, you feel, you feel weak, you feel soft. I couldn't protect my child. You know, they take my child, they take my son. I didn't stop it. I mean, how, how would you feel? feel helpless, you know, um, and, and, and there's that weakness, there's also that fear, because you don't know if your child's alive or not, and if your child is alive, they come back home, who are they, what are they going to do, you know, they've been out in the field doing who knows what to, to, to people you may know, and they come back to you, what's, how have they changed? On one of my first trips to northern Uganda, which is a place I focused on, I'm looking at this issue, I went to a village where, um, where um, World Vision and Save the Children were running, and UNICEF were operating rehabilitation clinics for kids who've been demobilized or who had escaped being child soldiers with um, that man over there, Joseph Coney, the LRA. And, and they came back to these centers and they were sent home. And, you know, and there was a situation not long after I got to this village where a boy had been a child soldier, he was sent back home, probably too, obviously too early, and about a month or so after being home, he ended up um, stoning his sister that they thought he'd been cured. You know, he, he spent a month at the center, you know, he's healed, even though he'd been in the field for six years killing people. So, you know, it, it's a situation, you know, you know, when I first started looking at it after the genocide of Rwanda, it was just emerging as an issue then. Now it's more recognized in the general public, but still it's, it's so underreported and so underaddressed because, you know, it breaks my heart to even 
recognize this fact that there are more child soldiers now than I, when I first started looking at the issue 18 years ago. There are more kids now fighting in wars than there were a decade and a half ago. Probably because there are more wars going on, but also because of the proliferation of small arms. And you know, even in this country, the United States, we're fighting kids in Afghanistan, which I saw with my own eyes, and we're fighting kids in Iraq. Because kids are the most obvious and prevalent source of, of soldiers. I mean, in any community in war, who's left behind? Women, children, the elderly, and, you know, and young people. So if you're a young person can carry an AK-47 or an RPG or grenades, why, you know, from an amoral point of view, why not put them in a uniform and send them to fight? And that's, that's, that's what we're facing now. We often reference boys when we think about child soldiers, but oftentimes, young girls <coughs> face just as great a future during times of conflict. Nicole, can you speak to the effect that armed <coughs> conflicts can have on young girls and women? So again, conflict creates opportunities for traffickers um, to prey on the vulnerable in these situations, um, create, um, make women and children vulnerable. Um, they become targets, money makers, um, and it's really because there's no one there to protect them. Um, I'm, if we look at the Joseph Coney and LRA, yes, the boys are trafficked. A becoming a child soldier is a form of um, labor trafficking, actually. And um, yes, the boys are trafficked to be child soldiers, but um, I, there is not a lot talked about how the siblings, the sisters, um, or even the girls are trafficked to be child sex slaves. Um, and I kind of want to put a twist on this because I don't know a ton about um, international issues and kind of put a twist on it with what I know here in the United States and vulnerabilities here in the United States because conflict creates vulnerabilities. Um, and Jimmy brought up something really great is um, gangs um, and how there's a lot of gang-related trafficking here in the United States. Um, and even looking at that and the vulner vulnerabilities um, bringing people in, into gangs, but um, children are preyed upon because they are easily able to be molded. Um, they're naive and traffickers and pimps believe that they can um, brainwash them and manipulate them in which they can a lot easier than they can maybe a 25 year old woman or a 30 year old woman. Um, but there's a subpopulation of children here in the United States who are more vulnerable um, to becoming trafficked, and those are um, those who have experienced extensive trauma, abuse, um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, domestic violence, uh, um, neglect, experimenting with drugs, maybe their parents are involved in drugs. And so I think there's a lot of things to say between looking at crossovers with vulnerability um, that that puts children at so much more risk, whether it's conflict or things that they're experiencing in their life um, that make them more vulnerable and susceptible to being trafficked. Our discussion has been about international humanitarian laws being broken, loss of civil liberties, civil rights, civil liberties, human dignity, respect, and in many ways, a loss of a normal way of life. Can you all speak how the average person can have an impact on these issues? And specifically, Rebecca, how can we take advantages of social media to spread awareness of these issues and influence action? Well, frankly, I have a feeling everybody in here under the age of 40 is more familiar with most of these social networks than everybody over 40, but the reality is the tools are already there. They've been there for a while. They've been there your whole lifetimes, and they've been there most of mine. But I can honestly tell you, the biggest difference is they can know how to use them. And you will have more communication in a given situation and access to data that nobody has ever had before. And the trick is, for everybody, no matter where you've been involved, know what you can find. But also, don't take everything for granted as truth either. So when you go somewhere, you're looking at a situation. You could be looking at situations around the world right now. Everything from, you know, 
have. There's so many right now, even inside this country, that you could look at. Don't take things for granted. If you read something, or you hear it on TV, or you see it in a TV show, or you see it in a movie, don't assume that that's a reality. Go look it up. It's how we all basically do all of our jobs. The, when people talk about how you can help, the best thing you can do right now to help is go learn. And go learn as much as you can so that you're more useful to the Red Cross, to any other humanitarian organizations, to the government, to law enforcement, to everybody else. You are more useful if you have the education to know what is and what isn't. And also to never take anything on first sight at this point. As far as trafficking is concerned and how to get the message out there about this issue, it's awareness. Um, it is, uh, people ask us all the time, what can we do? How do we help? Um, have, how many of you raising your hands have seen the movie Taken? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, you know, at least I can speak for myself. When I saw that movie, I was like, man, I want to be Liam Neeson and go break down those doors and <laughs> shoot everybody up. And, um, that's not what happens, and you can't go in, you know, you got to leave it to the law enforcement to go in and do the brothel raids and rescue the kids um, and bring them to the aftercare facilities and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what the um, common person can do, um, and really is the most important because knowledge, I always say this to my kids and they roll their eyes at me, um, knowledge is power, um, and when we give the kids the tools and knowledge to protect themselves, that makes them that more, much more protected when they're out in the community. Um, if we raise the awareness um, to adults in communities, then they're more aware of maybe a situation that could be happening in their community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and not being a bystander and um, reporting it when you see it. I'll say two things. One, I would echo something that I said to, to you and Ethan and Tim Beard and your other classmates earlier this week. Um, which is that you all have inherent power, even at the age you're at now, as teens in high school or about to go to college, you know, you have an inherent power, we all do, to do something, to stand up, to speak out, to challenge a peer on an issue or encourage them to do something about an injustice. Um, often when I go to school, high schools or colleges, especially in high school, students will say, I can't vote, I don't have any money, I'm living with my parents, like I don't have certain things you know, to affect change, but you do if you have voice. Um, you know, when I was first envisioning what became Man Up, um, and this is something else you should do, which ties into what everyone has said with Kamala as far, I did my research, I studied, I educated myself. Um, and I, because I want to know, in terms of movements for change in the past, how did they succeed and how did they, what were the challenges, how did they fail? So I read books on the civil rights movement and the troubles in Northern Ireland and South Africa and other movements for change to see what worked, what didn't work, and what could have been changed. And you know, for me, it's so exciting that this generation now because at times I really wish um, that I'd been born in the past 20 years because um, the opportunities almost seem limitless for what you can do with social media and other, other tools. And as Rebecca said, you're inundated with so much propaganda, some of it worthwhile, some of it not, but I mean, you, you seem better equipped this generation to uh, discern what, what's, what's real, what's effective. Um, also, too, you know, social media is very much a, it's a tool for all of us to use, but it's very much a tool of this younger generation. But it's a tool for, for those of us who are older as well. And I say that because I think that those of us who are older, have a, have a certain responsibility to be mentors, to pass on our experience, our knowledge, um, our lessons to the youth, because um, we have to, we have to understand that you know we're, when we all do, we're faced with so many so many social challenges right now that um, and so most of us who are older have faced these before in different forms, and we have a knowledge base that is not on social media, it's not on Facebook, we're not tweeting about it, it's not online. It's just by sitting and talking to people who are older. It's by ask, it's by reaching out and saying, I want to learn about this issue, or you know, I want to learn about trafficking. What, what you know, when you first started out, what was it like? How do you, how do you build an organization? How did you raise money? Um, how did you start public speaking? Just asking the the one-on-one -on -one question. Social media is a great tool, but that's all it is. You can't build a movement off social media. 
you can't create lasting transformation off of Facebook and Twitter. It's that human interaction that's gonna that create behavior change, and we have to recognize that. Thank you to the students for spending your vacation time with us. Uh, this is the, your summer, and you are spending time to learn, to have be more knowledgeable, to help us spread the mission, our value of equality and human dignity. So thank you very much for being here. Um, to my left, uh, thank you for the panel for uh, making us a little concerned about our Facebook profiles and also for us <laughs> learning um, a lot more uh, on these topics. Thank you so much. We got you a little gift uh, that comes from all, um, our hearts. Thank you again. Have a good night, everybody.